Hi everyone, my name is Brooke Anderson and I'm a PhD student in the Environmental Life Sciences program advised by Jane Silikowski. And I'll be sharing preliminary results of my dissertation on the movements of pregnant corbicle sharks in the Northwest Atlantic. So as a brief introduction, the corbicle is a large shark species that has suffered severe declines in the population one aspect of the population's biology that is needed for management is understanding the habitats used during gestation, as well as the locations where this population gives birth. This could be used to develop protected areas for the population. Unfortunately, information on movements during pregnancy is often unknown due to difficulties of determining the reproductive state of live sharks. The traditional approach to studying shark reproduction relies on lethal dissection. This is not really a desirable approach for threatened or endangered species such as the poor beagle. So in recent decades, alternative methods for studying shark reproduction have started to be developed. For example, you can use ultrasound, such as seen here, to confirm pregnancy in live sharks. And then this can be combined with satellite tags to identify locations during gestation and pupping. So my research will be one of the first to identify movement patterns of confirmed pregnant sharks specifically poor beagles, throughout their gestation and identify possible pupping grounds. So we targeted poor beagle sharks via rod and reel just southeast of Cape Cod, Massachusetts in late October, 2020. Mature females were given an ultrasound to confirm pregnancy and pregnant sharks were given a satellite tag called a thin mount satellite tag. This tag is attached to the shark's dorsal fin and after release, that tag will transmit the shark's location whenever the fin and the tag is above the sea surface. So to move on to the results of this preliminary study, I'm gonna show you a movie of the tracks of three pregnant poor beagles that were tagged in late October, 2020, you can follow along um, with the timestamp at the top of this map video. So as you can see, the pregnant poor beagle sharks all had a residency period in the coastal waters near Cape Cod from the time we tagged them until sometime in February. And then in February, all three of these pregnant sharks had coordinated movements where they moved offshore and stopped transmitting. And what you'll see is they're all gonna reappear again on or near coastal waters near Cape Cod in late April or May. Now, what's really interesting is that during the expected popping window for these sharks, which is from May through June, all three of these sharks were near coastal waters along New England, and they each also made really near shore movements during this time, which could indicate that this is where these sharks went to give birth. Now these results align really well with local fishermen experiences. For example, this is a video sent to us by a fisherman offshore of Maine, this is a video of a young of the year or a newborn four-week-old pup that he caught. So to conclude this research, we found that waters of New England are important habitats for pregnant poor beagle sharks and their pups. And it appears that pupping occurs near coastal waters of New England for this population. Thank you. Here are my acknowledgments and my email in the bottom left corner if you have any questions.
Hello and welcome. My name is Esther Giraud, and I'm happy to present some of the work I have been involved in as a graduate student and research associate at the Swedish Center for Sustainable Food Systems at ASU. In this video, I will present the critical to the list for organic agriculture, co-authored with Dr. Kathleen Merrigan, Executive Director of the Swedish Center and former Deputy Secretary of the United States Department of Agriculture, and Catherine Green, Senior Fellow at the Swedish Center and former researcher on U.S. organic agriculture at the USDA Economic and Research Service. This report was published in June 2021, and it details 46 recommendations for the 46 presidents of the United States to strengthen organic agriculture and leverage its benefits for health, the U.S. economy, and climate. The 46 recommendations are divided into four sections, governance, health, economics, and climate. In this presentation, I will develop four of these recommendations, and I encourage you to read our report and reach out to me if you would like to learn about all of them. The very first recommendation in our report and in this presentation is to develop a national organic plan. That is, uh, to set comprehensive strategies and interlocking policies to support the current and next generation of organic farmers in their efforts to reach high value markets. For example, California Certified Organic Farmers, or CCOF, developed such a plan for the state of California. Implementing such a plan at the federal level would strongly benefit organic farmers along with the health of our communities. Why do we need such a plan? Organic farmers and ranchers are research pioneers who can drive change towards more sustainable production practices and also help fight climate change. Rotational, for, rotational grazing, for example, what you can see on the screen, uh, supports healthy, healthy soils that capture carbon and has been implemented by organic farmers for a long time. More generally speaking, it is critical to strengthen the presence of organic agriculture at the roundtables on climate change strategy and sustainable agriculture. For example, the USDA climate hubs or interagencies working groups. To develop such a plan, USDA should seek inputs and collaboration from diverse stakeholders across the country, such as USDA staff from multiple agencies or staff from the Food and Drug Administration, members of the National Organic Standards Board, farmers, ranchers, processors, uh, NGOs in sustainable agriculture and organic and um, state departments of agriculture and tribal nations. Second, uh, is the second recommendation here is also number 11 in our report, and it's to procure organic food. USDA has a long history of supporting various producer groups and commodities through Section 32 of the Agricultural Adjustment Act to support domestically produced foods and respond to crisis. For example, Section 32 is what supported the Farmers to Family Food Program for distribution in 2020 during the pandemic. Organic foods have never benefited from it under the rationale that they already benefit from price premiums. However, historically, Section 32 purchases stabilized market prices to prevent them from plummeting and is used to support specific um, agricultural sectors. So USD should develop a procurement strategy to support the organic sector and leverage the benefit for health, economy, and climate. Three, promote home organic supply chains. The demand for organic products has been increasing consistently. Interesting fact for us in Arizona, our state is now number 11 for certified organic sales in the US. In 2020, organic sales increased by 12.4% nationally, according to the OTA. Meanwhile, the US imports a large quantity of organic foods. Tracked imports represent 44% of the domestic value of US organic farm sales for fruits and nuts, and 12% of the domestic value of U.S. organic farm sales for vegetables. And there's likely a significant underestimation for imports since they are not all tracked. During the pandemic, food shortages have highlighted the importance of regional and local food supply chains. Small organic businesses have quickly adapted, especially through direct sales and CSA, Community Supported Agriculture. And there's a strong opportunity to promote organic supply chains at home. Last recommendation here, uh, it, it focuses on in, uh, insurance tools. Organic farmers have been at a historical disadvantage in insuring their crops, especially because they could only be insured at the conventional price value. And insurance programs had rules that did not accept the agronomic practices used in organic production systems. 
Another reason is that fruits and vegetables dominate the organic food production, but insurance options favor commodities such as corn, soy, and wheat, and remain limited for fruits and vegetables. There are some, um, these are some examples of changes in insurance tools that could better support organic farmers. One, drop the insurance restrictions on operations using cover crops. Cover crops are very widely used in organic farms. Two, eliminate the cap on organic contract price. Three, improve the whole farm's revenue protection program. Four, better communicate the existing public support for insurances to organic producers and crop insurance agents. To conclude, these are only a few examples of changes that could support the organic sector in meaningful ways. To learn more, I invite you to read and out download our, our, our reports at the link on the screen. I also invite you to re reach out to us at the Swedish Center for Sustainable Food Systems at ASU with your questions on organic agriculture, and we will be happy to share with you our review of the research. Thank you for listening. Welcome. In this brief presentation, I will give you a snapshot of my doctoral research that I defended last month. The title is Integrating Care into Food Systems. And before I start, I would like you to think about what care means to you. Think and feel. What are your experiences of caring and being cared for? Food systems are the objects of recurring crisis. Recently, COVID and now the war in Ukraine are having effects on supply chains, and we're experiencing inflation on products such as oil, fertilizers, and wheat. Once more, this crisis reveal that our food systems are globally interconnected and vulnerable. Global and local injustices are also highlighted as people experience food insecurity and require food aid or food banks to make by. This is all happening in the context in which agriculture is a leading cause of climate change, soil erosion and deforestation, endangering our ecosystems. Meanwhile, many actors and movements aim to restore, repair, and regenerate the soils and the living web, and to reconnect people with one another and with the natural environment through food. The notion of care is often used by them to characterize their practices, either formally, like in the case of permaculture or care farming that really put care at the front and center, or less formally in discourses that call to care for the earth. These questions that you see on the screens are the overarching research questions of my dissertation. First, how, do in, how to integrate care into food systems? And then what are the outcomes of such an integration? In each chapter, I ask specific questions that provide elements of answer. The general methodology is interdisciplinary and inspired from social sciences. The literature review brings together diverse streams of research and practices such as ethics of care, permaculture, food well-being, and food system resilience, among others. The bulk of the data consists of semi-directed interviews with everyday food system experts conducted in Cuba, in Arizona, and in France. It also includes survey data from a survey conducted on 96 gardeners in Arizona and two other local case studies. Analysis uses both inductive and deductive methods. My dissertation is divided into five chapters. Chapter three and four are already published in Sustainability Journal and in Humanities Journal. In chapter three is co-written with Dr. Sarah Ali Al-Sayed and Adenike Opichin. On this slide, I will present a visual summary of my dissertation. So these that you see on the screen are the two overarching questions that I asked. Again, so how to integrate care into food systems and what are the outcomes of that? In chapter two, I asked what does care mean in the context of food systems? Using both the literature and the interviews, and grounding theory for analysis, I developed this conceptual, conceptual map of care in a food system context that distinguishes between motives to care, care practices, and outcomes of care practices. Four categories of care practices emerge from participant responses. Internal dispositions, such as attentiveness, patience, humility, and gratitude. The other three are borrowed from the permaculture literature, earth care, people care, and fair share. Interconnectedness is at the center. Connection and interconnection are core aspects of care. And motives to care and the care practices and outcomes of these practices all stem from this interconnectedness. In this chapter, I also look at food system resilience as an outcome of each of these care practices. 
In chapter three, I focus on earth care practices and I looked at policies and cultural transformation that can support the integration into food systems. I also look at how they contribute to enhancing well-being. Specifically, I show that earth care practices are associated with a sense of purpose and fulfillment and enhance what is called eudaimonic well-being, which is sense of purpose. In chapter four, I look at urban food autonomy movements and uh, how they integrate care into food systems using the four categories of practices. These movements are grassroots initiatives that encourage urbanites to learn how to grow their own food, increase food production areas in the cities, and place a preference on local food consumption. I also look at sustainability as defined by the, system, the UN Sustainable Development Goals as outcomes of these practices and how these movements participate in reaching the SDGs. So I conclude with uh, some research and policy recommendations. First, center growing food in school curriculums. It is part of ecological literacy and on the long run it is harmful not to teach young generations to work with nature to feed themselves. Uh, there are many examples of successful programs of school working with school gardens. And so we could, for example, run pilot studies that look at the well-being of the kids who were in such program over time and especially as adults. And uh, also, uh, last June, uh, the Swedish Center that I work for published a report with 46 recommendations to leverage the benefits of organic agriculture. And one of these is to use public procurement to purchase organic food for schools, for example, through the National School Lunches and Breakfast or the Women, Infant, Children program. Th three, um, I recommend to include community health and well-being into the realm of political action. Health and well-being are not merely individual metrics, they are powered by communities, and including community health and well-being is a way to contribute to the development, a development of a culture of care. For a long time, care has been denigrated and hidden from the public sphere, and with it, all the people and the other living that perform this care. I believe it is time we are integrate care at the front and center of our public spaces as something that has both intrinsic and instrumental value for our world. Thank you. Hello, my name is Caitlin Lynch and this is Ricky Martin. We are both PhD students in the Innovation in Global Development program here at ASU inside the College of Global Futures. We're gonna share with you some preliminary findings around disruptive innovation for global development funding. Coming into the semester, Ricky and I both knew from previous literature review that the traditional model for development funding has a lot of inefficiencies. A lot of the money does not actually make it to the boots on the ground. We were curious about lessons from other disciplines like entrepreneurship and disruptive innovation and how those lessons might be able to be applied to address these issues for development. Uh, we were also curious about whether or not Increasing private sector partnerships as a method of funding would improve the efficacy of development organizations work. So when we had the opportunity to work in the social innovation startup lab here at ASU, we honed in on this question. Can social innovation startups bridge the gap? Can social entrepreneurship be the answer to this old-fashioned funding model that we know is inefficient. In order to answer this question, we conducted a literature review and held unstructured interviews. So we looked further at the global development ecosystem, and there's a wide variety of organizations, almost 15,000 in the U.S. alone, that do this work. Um, and so these global development organizations, they carry out a large majority of the work here. And I myself had the privilege of working for one of these for a number of years and firsthand saw the inefficiencies and grew frustrated with the work and the actual impact that these were doing. And a lot of that relates to the funding mechanism behind it, where when trying to support projects on the ground, the funding never actually makes it to the end user. So what you're seeing right now is a very complicated and convoluted path showing the funding from the beneficiaries, such as USAID, and where it goes through to actually have the end user and the amount that actually comes out the other end. To simplify this, we chose to show a very simple graph illustrating the traditional funding mechanism. So our research have showed, for example, in one year alone, $189 billion went into this mechanism, but through processes, bureaucracy, international lobbying, fundraising, misappropriation, and a variety of other things, only 58 billion actually made it out. That's 30% that's only making it to the end user. Fortunately, there is an alternative source from this traditional funding 
that's not as heavily utilized, and that is of corporate funding or corporate social responsibility, or CSR for short. So this alternative source isn't being properly utilized in the global development funding ecosystem, and this is what we chose to explore further. We know that on the side of corporations, all stakeholders involved are very interested in them holding these kinds of CSR partnerships. And yet, uh, we know that from our literature review that nonprofits are still not securing these funds. For instance, in India alone, there's one NGO for every 400 citizens and less than 50% of the nonprofits in all of India were able to secure CSR funding in a given year. So in our interviews, we really wanted to explore what that experience is like from different perspectives and why this might be happening. So with that said, we spoke to individuals from corporations, social sector, and academia, and an incredible theme emerged. We found corporations, represented here by this little symbol, were constantly approached by individual organizations that are large, medium, and small size. And these corporations highly desire, but often lack the experience connections to foster these relationships. So these organizations, there's not only several of them, but there's hundreds of them that come out and they're all doing incredible work. These development organizations, our interviews have shown, really seek these partnership opportunities as well. But the interviews really say that although they stress it, they have the inability or they lack the inability, I'm sorry, to actually foster these relationships. So this combined together shows how desirable, sustainable, and effective partnerships based on shared value, values and interests truly are. That was a huge theme that came out of the interviews we conducted. But overall, there are a lot of logistical challenges for both parties in getting CSR funds on the ground, even though it is a source of less restricted funding than the traditional model, such as funds from USAID. We do think from our literature review and interviews that social enterprise could serve as a disruptive innovation in improving this development funding model and getting more funds uh, on the ground to the programs that need them. And we also found that development practitioners do believe that private funding could increase the efficacy of their programs. So what are we doing next? We are going to keep asking these questions, especially through the lens of disruptive innovation theory to see if there's any kind of innovation that might address these specific issues in order to get development projects to be more beneficial to those they intend to benefit. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share these preliminary findings with you. If you're interested in hearing more about our research, feel free to reach out to us via email. You can see it here. Thanks. Hello, my name is Emily Harding. I'm a senior in the School of Sustainability, and I'm presenting on my research for my undergraduate honors thesis that I worked on with my committee, Dr. Kaylin Kretz, Dr. Gwen Iacona, and Dr. Hannah Breitz. The title is Mission Statement Alignment for Partnering and Non-Partnering Land Managing Organizations. And so the motivation behind this was a love for nature. And right here I have the, an image of the Quail Ridge Reserve, which is one of the protected areas that is, was managed by one of the organizations in my data. And so, the research question was, to what extent do the mission statements align between the group of land managing organizations that partner with other organizations at least once and the group that never partners? And so what I mean by partners or partnerships is the spatial overlap. So on the right, in the light blue shaded areas, you can see the protected areas in California, and then the dark shaded areas where the partnerships are those spatial overlaps. And then the image on the left that just shows like what those spatial uh, partnerships look like. And then the data was all California. There were 1,144 organizations and they're all at different levels. So NGO, federal, state, local, district, and private. And the reason why California was because it just had a large data set. And the reason why for mission statements though was because mission statements show the main priorities and goals of an organization, as well as help with other things like op guide operations or attract stakeholders. And then the hope was that we could learn more about organizations that manage land, what their priorities are to help um, lead to better uh, partnerships and then hopefully more effective and efficient biodiversity outcomes. And then in this image, I have a screenshot of a mission statement from an uh, organization for the data that I collected for, which was one of the methods. Other methods included uh, text analysis and creating themes as well as 
creating word clouds and frequency lists in R, which would help me create those themes. And then on the right, I have like a list of the table. Um, so like community and conservation were two of the most important ones that came up. So in to the results now, I have the partnering group on the left and then I'm partnering group on the right. And you can see right away visually that there are differences. So in the partnering group, more conservation themed words such as nature, conserve, land, and protect show up. And then on the non-partnering group, you can see more community themed words like city, provide, community, service, and quality show up. So I wanted to know what the differences, uh, what caused these differences. So I went back to the different levels that they were at and saw that in the partnering group, the um, NGOs made up the largest percentage. And then in the non-partnering group, the local, so like city and districts, those made up um, the largest percentage of the non-partnering group. And then I put these side by side, the, a word cloud side by side to see if there were differences by level. And then sure enough, I saw that. So in the district, you can see words like water, provide, and district. And then in the local one, community, service, quality, provide, and city. And then in the NGO were the conservation themed words like conserve, land, protect, and nature. And so then I wanted to see if by level in each group, partnering and non-partnering group, if they were the same or different. And so I included an example here of NGOs. So on the left side, it's the partnering group, the right side, the non-partnering group. You can see in the partnering group, it has the same words, conserve, land, protect, and nature. And then in the non-partnering group, it has those same words in the, uh, as the most frequently occurring, but they also have up there community and county and education. And so this shows that in the non-partnering group, they also had the community themed words. And so I went through all of these different levels and um, partnering and non-partnering groups and put a plus if the words that were most frequently occurring fell into those categories or a minus if they didn't. And then what I found in conclusion was that partnering group uses conservation themed language more frequently and the non-partnering group uses community themed language more frequently. And then this was due to the makeup of the groups. So the non-partnering group had mostly district and local city uh, and county governments. And then what we're doing now is looking at the quanti quantitative results and as well as looking at the context. So we're pulling out phrases instead of just the most frequently occurring words um, that are just single words, we're now pulling them out as phrases so we can see if they're actually being used in a con conversation or conservation context or a community context. And that will just help strengthen the themes table and the, the actual themes that they fall into. And so I just wanna say thank you. Um, and thank you to my thesis director, Dr. Kaylin Kretz, and my two committee members, Dr. Gwen Iacona and Dr. Hannah Breitz, as well as a special thanks to Caitlin Lee for helping me out with R and thank you to my friends and family. And I also have here my email in case anyone wants to reach out and hear the rest of the uh, research and hear what we're doing now, or maybe read the paper. So thank you so much. Hello, my name is Carly Wyman, MS in Sustainable Food Systems, presenting today along with Mackenzie Martinez, seeking her MS in Sustainable Food Systems. This research project is entitled Industrial Juicing to Advance Food Security in the Hawaiian Islands. The motivation behind this report has to do with Hawaii's high levels of food insecurity. Hawaii is very reliant on outside sources of for food. Studies show that Hawaii imports anywhere between 85 to 90 percent of its consumable foods. This reliance on shipping has been a subject of growing concern in the public sphere, as this leaves our food system vulnerable to interruptions in shipping, such as hurricanes or pandemics. In addition to this low level of food security, high overhead costs make it difficult for local small-scale farmers to make a viable living from farming. Farmers face issues such as labor shortages, high costs of inputs, including electricity, and face barriers to accessing land with high competition from development. Olohana Foundation, a small Hawaii Island nonprofit organization, is taking these issues head on through a recent acquisition of legacy industrial scale aseptic, meaning pasteurization, juicing equipment. This valuable equipment could help to solve the twin issues of low levels of food self-sufficiency while also allowing farmers to add value to their crops, allowing them to fetch a higher price for their products. We partnered with Olohana Foundation asking the question, how can Olohana Foundation develop their aseptic juicing line to best support increased food self-sufficiency in the islands? How can the juicing line be redeployed in a manner to provide sustainable economic opportunity to producers and other community members? 
Our methodology was a mixed methods approach. This involved collecting primary data via two surveys distributed to both fruit growers as well as potential fruit buyers. We also interviewed 15 Hawaii food systems experts and players. Finally, we completed desk research to access crop production data, as well as to conduct a literature review on relevant topics. Here are some of the key findings from our research. Firstly, we looked at the equipment itself to understand what the capabilities of this equipment are and what it would take to put it back into operation. We learned that this line of equipment is extremely valuable and operates at a high capacity. Generally, such a juicing line is run for five days straight due to the involved sanitization process that must be completed before and after operation. To illustrate, we learned that to run, for example, the paddle finisher, which separates the skin and seeds out from the fruit, we would need a minimum of 1,000 pounds per hour to, of papaya to justify running such equipment. This amounts to a minimum of 6 million pounds or a maximum of 12 million pounds of papaya per year. In 2019, the amount of recorded papaya production in Hawaii was just under 12 million pounds. In other words, this machinery has the capacity to process the entire annual papaya production of the Hawaiian Islands. This would, therefore, necessitate a steady and consistent supply of local fruits to ensure a viable fruit juice or puree product. Which potential fruits are being produced in abundant enough quantities to supply a system of this scale? The majority of our fruit grower survey respondents do not currently sell their fruits. We also found that nearly half of respondents have excess fruit that could be sold, turned into value-added products, and more. Diversity was also found to be the norm. The average number of fruit tree varieties that respondents are growing is 15. Finally, the majority are interested in learning more about joining a fruit growers cooperative. These numbers clearly show that small, diversified farmers may benefit from a cooperative structure that could pool small and diverse fruit harvests from growers who otherwise may have excess fruit growing to waste. These were the top crops in production based on our growers survey. From this available supply, valuable fruit purees and juices could be produced, including through blended, blended fruit products. Next, we looked at the commercial demand for local fruit products through surveying 11 local commercial fruit buyers. Additionally, we examined broader national juice market trends and also looked at the potential for producing agricultural inputs with the equipment. These were the most in-demand fruits. 100% of survey respondents were interested in sourcing lulakoi or passion fruit. 90% were interested in purchasing oranges. Importantly, the main barriers of these commercial fruit buyers to marketing and serving Hawaii sourced fruit products were cost and lack of consistent supply. None of these buyers listed a lack of demand from customers as a barrier to selling such products. This juicer project can help bridge a gap between local producers and the high market demand for Hawaii grown fruits. Demand for beverages containing functional ingredients such as those listed in the chart above is growing. Many of these crops are grown in Hawaii, including turmeric, ginger, oranges, cacao, and others. This shows that Hawaii-grown specialty crops have a place in the marketplace. What if this equipment could be used to produce agricultural inputs instead of food? Our team also explored this possibility specifically to produce agricultural inputs used in Korean natural farming methods. Through producing such inputs, there is potential to increase self-sufficiency since many farmers are reliant on expensive imported fertilizers and inputs in the Hawaiian Islands. The juicer equipment can produce these inputs, making them more accessible to local, local farmers. This market is also accessible. Few other companies in Hawaii are producing them commercially. Because of the community-driven nature of this project already under, underway, the values and mission of the Olahana Foundation and the nature of fruit supply, we found that a cooperative model would be well-suited towards this project. Hawaii fruit producers interviewed and surveyed were very interested in joining a cooperative. Overall, almost 70% were interested in learning more about joining a fruit growers cooperative. Respondents were very interested in cooperative benefits such as bulk purchasing of inputs, guaranteed market for access slash overripe crops, education and information sharing, accessing compost and other inputs from the cooperative, and assistance with harvesting. Those surveyed expressed an interest in the cooperative, providing a few different benefits, including receiving supporter training in business planning and marketing, horticulture and crop sciences. Almost 74% were interested in receiving training in sustainable, organic, or natural farming and garden practices, 
and almost 57% reported interest in new tools and technologies. Developing a cooperative that meets the express needs of producers will further incentivize participation and thus guaranteed a fruit supply. Overall takeaways, while there is currently likely not enough of any one type of locally grown fruit available at the quantities needed to utilize the equipment as it was previously set up, the machinery has the potential for blends, fermented products, and more. A business model that includes a diversified input and output mix will likely be the strongest approach for making the, mo the most of this equipment. More research should be conducted with a focus on what local products could work for creating value-added product markets. The importance of community-driven food security became clear in this research process. We found three key aspects of this community-led food security project. Community leaders or champions are very important drivers for such products projects, excuse me. Number two, a diversity of institutional stakeholders play various intersecting roles. And three, stakeholders both provide inputs as well as receive benefits from such projects, closing the loop for a more sustainable community-led food system. Thanks so much for watching today. Please feel free to reach out with any further questions. Hello. I'm Thomas Boyster, and this is my applied project on envisioning biomimetic architecture for the Virtual Design Lab course taught by clinical assistant professor Michelle Fahler in the Biomimicry Master's program. My background is in architecture and game design, and this presented an opportunity to integrate biomimicry with these fields as a way of responding to the global threats such as climate change and species loss through the lens of the built environment and at a scale which is appropriate to the scale of these challenges. In addition to the support of my instructor, the work is informed by the feedback from Dr. David Frederick and Frank Jacobus, as well as my peer advisors Nicholas Heyer, Mejda Kakar, and Willie Shu. Biomimicry and architecture is already being explored by several other practitioners around the world and offers a positive vision centered around a bio-inclusive ethos to improve the built world. World building and game design complements this by offering an additional lens to bridge the gap in awareness and education at scale. Virtual worlds can make the regenerative benefits of biomimicry legible to the general public through serious games, showcasing interactive illustrations in the built environment. The methodology synthesis is itself part of the project, considering the combination of the biomimicry thinking methodology with architectural design phases and game design production steps, resulting in a variety of hybrid steps and diagrams. The project is constrained to a vertical slice demo that looks at all the key components needed for a larger aspirational project to prove out their viability and allows for this experimentation with the methodology itself as I go. Following from a broad search through organisms and biological champions, the symbiotic pairing of the Venus's flower basket sponge and glass sponge shrimp, which often spends its entire adult life within these sponges, provided an enclosure assembly which was abstracted to allow for speculative emulation in an architectural double wall assembly. These emulations were then modeled and imported into a game engine where interaction with wall assembly layers, as you see here, demonstrated the ability to investigate and better grasp the composition and relationships present in the architecture. Spatial patterns such as air movement or heat flow through a space are also indicated with 3D arrows that move upon interaction to better communicate what is happening beyond what you can see. As part of the connection to a local site, Available materials are represented by trees and rocks with a material limit number shown to inform the scarcity of materials and how that affects how much can be built and where it comes from. This can also show the impact on an ecosystem as more and more materials are removed. Additionally, a system for modular construction provides a basis for exploration of life's principles, especially local attunement and resource efficiency as they relate to one another, as the materials that you've just extra extracted become visibly used up in the construction of a different scale or size of assembly. This can be done collaboratively as well, which helps with learning, but can also be an interesting design tool for communities to consider their impacts.
With additional overlays such as load tracing arrows or color-coded systems level flows, a wide variety of different emulations and topics of education are supported. The viability of this demo shows that serious games offer distinct opportunities to advocate for sustainability, especially in the context of architecture and biomimicry as they reinforce one another. The digital nature of these games offers rapid scalability beyond the capacity of a single constructed building or in-person workshop. This research will be expanded not only with additional overlays and emulations, but also with a narrative framing to introduce the game themes and mechanics and increasing flexibility of the building system. For the purposes of this demo, the game engine Unreal Engine 4 was used and several asset packs were employed to constrain focus on the workflow and quickly reach a prototype for iteration. Thank you to my aforementioned support committee and peer advisory team and to my incredible wife Kate, without whom none of this would be possible. Please feel free to reach out with questions. Hello, my name is Nicole Ferriolo. I am a senior right now at ASU. I graduate December of 22, which is very exciting for me. I am a sustainability bachelor's in science with a focus in energy technology materials, as well as a nursing minor in hopes to finish my nursing degree as soon as I finish my bachelor's in sustainability, which is very exciting stuff. Um, this semester, I had the opportunity to work uh, to intern at a beautiful company called Project Cure, which I will stay on board for probably ever and just continue to volunteer there and get involved within the company. Uh, their motto is delivering help and hope to the world because we work with clinics and countries in need that need medical supplies and equipment. We're a nonprofit organization and we ship 40 foot containers to these clinics that need all the necessary supplies that our logistics team figures out. And then that's where warehouses come into play where I was interning at. Um, this week, we actually have containers going out to Ethiopia, Ukraine, which we've been sending a lot of stuff to, which is incredible, and the Dominican of Congo. So as you can see, I made a little lovely collage right over here, if I could get my spotlight to work. <laughs> um, these are the countries of the shipping containers that are going out this week. Um, this actually is a shipment that we got this morning. It is pallets. So I will help with day-to-day -day, uh, warehouse um, activities. I deal with um, incoming shipments, outgoing shipments, organizing, picking new loads, um, running volunteer groups, organizing volunteer groups, organizing tasks, um, looking at the supply chain process and seeing where we can do re um, waste reduction and make it more sustainable, how to implement sustainability within this warehouse in ways that we could never think of, that we never thought of before. Um, this, the picture in the top right-hand corner, that is some um, uh, deliveries that this lovely gentleman named Pete, uh, him and he comes every other Wednesday. Him and I go to clinics, we go to closing practices, we go to the hospitals and we pick up all this lovely equipment. Um, this actually is all the boxes and everything that is getting ready to go off and be shipped to, I believe, the Dominican of Congo. Um, the lovely gentleman in the middle is the gentleman that started this uh, an incredible organization called Project Cure. His name is Doug. Um, and then the picture to the far right, right here, is all the boxes and everything that we are getting ready to air crate to Ukraine. So we already sent an air crate um, shipment out to them, which is right here and here. Um, this is us packing a load. So we'll pack these giant 40 foot containers. And this is all of our incredible volunteers and donors and groups that I've ran over the past semester, giving me the incredible opportunity that I had. Um, everything that I've been working on has been helping me build upon applying sustainability to, the uh, to a large scale supply chain, 
um, problem solving every day that you go in, you go in thinking you're going to do one thing and then 20 other things pop up that you have to do. And something that I think this internship also gave me the opportunity to do is uh, numerous things. But the top two things I think is learning how to not get so overwhelmed and deal with and how to handle and problem solve these situations because it'll just be myself at the warehouse a lot of times and say for example I'll get 11 pallets and we have no room and I just have to find solutions and find incremental resilient solutions that'll help um that'll just make the most sense. And something that I will be forever grateful for is meeting and building and creating the incredible relationships that I have built at Project Cure, the incredible people that I've met, um, the stories, the knowledge that I've gained, everybody that I have um, worked with at Project Cure are incredible people that have a very extensive knowledge on everything and that are even if I'm not sure on how to solve a problem they will help me walk through how to solve a problem and how to come up with solutions on how to do this um so I would just like to thank everybody who's helped me thus far um everyone at ASU especially my wonderful wonderful supervisor at my internship Heather incredible person my roommates my family and yeah I will definitely keep very connected to Project Cure. And this internship was an incredible opportunity that I was given. Thank you, have a good one. Hi everyone, my name is Becca Campbell. I'm a PhD student at Arizona State University. Today I'm gonna to be presenting on some uh, preliminary observations of female Caribbean reef sharks in the Bahamas. A little background about me. I grew up on the Mississippi Gulf Coast right next to the ocean. I studied marine science in undergrad at University of Southern Mississippi with a minor in marine biology. While I was there, I conducted research on fish and got to touch a shark for the first time, which ignited my passion in shark conservation. And I've been doing that for the past five years. I'm currently working on my PhD in environmental life sciences at ASU. Uh, my dissertation is focused on Caribbean reef sharks in the Bahamas. So the species of interest for the study was Caribbean reef sharks. They're a medium bodied species distributed throughout the subtropical and tropical Atlantic Ocean. Uh, they're commonly found on coral reef ecosystems and shelves uh, throughout their range, but they're highly abundant on coral reefs in the Bahamas. They act as regulators of other mesopredators such as uh, larger fish or sharks and other primary consumers. They uh, provide a huge revenue source for the Bahamian islands through shark diving and ecotourism. But even though they're the most abundant species of shark in the Bahamas, there's very little known about their reproduction, movement, and habitat use. So the objectives of this study were to estimate these movement behaviors uh, and reproductive cycle of females in the Bahamas. To do this, we captured individuals using a method called drumline fishing. As shown in the photo on the bottom left, there is a float attached to a weight that sits on the bottom of the ocean. Attached to the weight is a 40 foot fishing line that's baited uh, so when a shark bites onto the hook, it's able to free swim until we pick up the gear and then secure the shark to the boat to do our sampling. All sharks were tagged with conventional tags as shown in the bottom right photo. Uh, it's just a small piece of plastic that's uh, inserted into the muscle of the shark. On the tag is ident an identification number as well as information on how to contact uh, us when the shark is recaptured. We also used a method 
to analyze the reproductive hormones in plasma of blood. So in the photo, I am taking a blood sample of a shark. Uh, reproductive hormones such as estradiol and testosterone can tell us what stage of reproductive uh, cycle these animals are in. We also used uh, ultrasonography on large females to see if they were pregnant in that moment while in the field. So shown in the photo is me ultrasounding a large Caribbean reef shark. Uh, so key findings of this study, we caught and conventionally tagged two adult Caribbean female reef sharks in August of 2021 down in the Bahamas. Uh, they had a mean total length of 191 centimeters. This is just becoming mature for Caribbean reef sharks. Uh, both of them had low hormone levels with a mean estradiol of 36.5 picograms per mil. And according to ultrasounds, neither of the females were pregnant. We then recaptured these same two females in December of 2021. What's interesting about this is that they were captured just one mile from the initial tagging event. Uh, both females had slightly elevated hormone levels with a mean estradiol of 64.6 picograms per mil, but neither of them were pregnant uh, via ultrasound. So in summary and conclusion, uh, we initially captured and then recaptured two adult Caribbean reef sharks, females, uh, just one mile apart um, from the initial tagging event uh, just after four months had passed. The mean estradiol levels had doubled between sampling events, but neither of the sharks were pregnant at either sampling event. So this is potentially exhibiting site fidelity behavior, which means the females are hanging around the same area or returning to the same area. Um, so this area could have potential benefits such as feeding grounds or highly protective for these newly mature females. But in order to make definitive conclusions, further data and analysis are required, such as acoustic telemetry, which can give us more fine scale information on their movement behaviors. I'd like to thank the Solikowski Shark and Fish Conservation Lab and its members, um, where I am currently working with to do my PhD, um, and Beneath the Waves for sponsoring me and hosting me to the Bahamas to do this research. If you have any further questions or would like any information, please email me at my email on the screen. Thank you so much.